In this final installment, we'll consider the compound interest formula, and we'll look at a reduction function in a couple of dimensions and see that not all functions necessarily need to be linear whenever we, um, we do a function reduction down to one variable. So consider the situation in which we have um, your future value is a function of p, how much you invest, an r, an interest rate of 5%, n is 12, meaning we're compounding monthly for t years. What does this function look like when t is set equal to 10, which means we're going to fix the time to 10 years. Well, at this point, we are the only two variables left would be a and p. And so as a result of that, we are looking at a graph or a graphical relationship of a versus p. So a of p, 0.05, 12, and t equal to 10 would reduce the function to, let's see, p times 1 plus 0.05 divided by 12 raised to the 12 times 10 power. Um, so this is the reduction function that we're looking at. Now we want to um, see how this looks and, and what, what exactly it tells us. So we'll go ahead and cursor over to Excel. And so what we want to do is we want to look at, we're going to want to look at different values of, of t for uh, treating p as the input variable. So maybe I will look at, since p is my initial balance, I guess I could look at it for, you know, zero. Maybe I'll do increments of $100 just because, you know, we probably don't invest $5 at a time. But it'll give us enough of a, a vision of, of, to see what's happening. Okay, so I've got uh, different starting dollar amounts. And, of course, my output in this function is A, which is the future value. So I'm going to want to calculate in the next row the future value for T being set fixed to 10 years. And so what I'll do here is, again, uh, I want this column right here to represent, in this case, time. So I'll just say I'll call this time, and we'll know that it's in years. And I want this row to represent my um, my starting value or my principal. So I'll just say maybe I'll just call this uh I, I guess I can call it P. I could have called them P and T, but maybe I'll just say print for principal. Actually, I want it lowercase. So I don't have to capitalize each time. So, okay. Um, it's not letting me rename it. Okay, well, we'll just use capital. So the way we calculate the future value is by taking uh, the present value, or the PRIN, uh, times 1 plus the interest rate, which is fixed to be 0.05, divided by 12, raised to the parentheses 12 times t power. Well, t is time, so now I want to calculate that right there. Well, of course, if you invest $0, even after 10 years, you're not going to have anything in terms of balance. And so now I can take a look at, wow, OK, so if I invest $500 after 10 years, I'll have $823. If I invest $400 at 5% compounded monthly for 10 years, I'll have $658.80. 80 cents approximately. And now, of course, I can go ahead and insert a graph and look at a scatter plot of this. So I will go ahead and choose right off from the start. I'll go ahead and do my 3D line graph. Now, that's an area graph. Let's see, where's my 3D line graph? Mm -hmm. Got to find this guy. There it is, 3D line graph. OK, and so I want to select my data. I'm going to add some entries. Uh, this is going to be. Let's see. So series name, series values are going to be these values here. And uh, next, I want to do series name, which is let's see this set of values here. Let's see what that looks like. Did I did do? Nope, didn't do what I wanted to do. So I'm going to need to edit that, and that's actually um, for this value here. And I want to edit. I want to edit the uh, x values. I don't want the x values to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I want them to be 0, 100, 200, 300, 400. So I'll go ahead and select those. So the axis label range is right there. And now, oh, there it is. Great. So that looks good. Click OK. And we see right now, again, we'll do some labeling here. This is now looking at future value versus uh, principal. OK, and I'm going to go over here and just make sure that things are nicely labeled because it's uh, a lot harder to try to figure out what's going on later. So this 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 uh, dimension, the vertical dimension, actually represents my future value. So I'll just put A. And this is the present value, how much I've dumped into the bank account. And this is time. This is the number of years 
that I've uh, that I'm going to be investing for. So right now we're just looking at A versus P, your future value based upon how much you invest, assuming you're going to be investing at uh, for 10 years, 5% compounded monthly. So we'll have to maybe we should say that in there as well. Oops, 5%. 5% compounded monthly. Okay, so uh, this is actually a linear function, you'll notice, um, and that's kind of uh, maybe something we wouldn't expect. However, whenever we do this computation here, uh, you'll notice that this whole quantity, this whole boxed up quantity right here, that's just a constant. I have one plus a number divided by a number is a number, raised to a number is a number. So this right here is a constant, and if I evaluate that, so I'll come over here to my spreadsheet and off to the side I'll just type in 1 plus 0 0.05 divided by 12 to the 12 times 10 power. And what I get is 1.647. So this equation here actually reduces to uh, A equals P times 1 point, what do we say, 6, 7, 6, 5, 6, 4, 7, excuse me which is the same thing as writing a equals 1.647p. And that's a linear function with a y-intercept of zero. So I can interpret this as saying, if I, for every $1 of present value, after 10 years at 5% compounded monthly, I will earn a buck 65 approximately for every dollar of present value I've put in. Very cool, so that's why we're seeing the linear function that we're seeing. Well, what about uh, if t is 20, or for that matter, if we look at uh, a series of a versus p graphs for time between 0 and 30 years, and we most certainly can do that very easily, in fact, by just adding, uh, okay, well, maybe I want to look at, uh, maybe, maybe not even 0, maybe it doesn't make sense to look at 0 years, because that's going to be very boring. And I can copy down, I, I guess I could just take that one cell and copy it uh, down. Oh, there we go. So now you can see what it would look like if you invested for 20 years. Of course, you would expect uh, a lot more money after 20 years. If I invest $100, I'll get $271.26 after 20 years. All the way up to if I invest $500 after 20 years, I will get $1,356. That's total, of course. Not, not We're not looking at just the interest. Okay, so now I'm going to expand my graph to show for t equals 20, and you can see that now the difference is these lines have different slopes. Um, in fact, if we if we had done the reduction, you notice that we got 1.647 was that was for 10 years. If I make the time period 20 years, the coefficient, like we had here, uh, the coefficient if t is set to 20 will be 2.71, which is very similar to that number right there. So if I invest $100, or for every $100 I invest, I get $271 of total return, which means that that's $2.71 per dollar of amount invested. And similarly, I could do the same thing for time 30. Take that row, copy it down, um, and now make sure my graph is referencing that data as well. And again, another line in three dimensions, and these lines just have progressively steeper slopes. And if I wanted to look at the rotation of this, I s most certainly could do that. And uh, we'll see that as we begin to rotate in that direction, this, these are probably very uncomfortable steps or tricky steps to try to climb up because their 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 inclines are all different. The inclines are gradually getting bigger as we go from left to right. Well, just for um, entertainment purposes, let me say we went in uh, five degree increment or five year increments. And um, now I'm just going to do equals this time period plus five years. I'm going to have to type it all in again. And I'll take this row and copy it down. And now I'll just take this whole row and go down to time 30. So take it two more years just so I get a nice, a nice, nice visual of what's going on here. OK, there we go. And so that's for various values of time plotted. Now you can almost see how this is kind of interesting. As if I were to look at it from this direction of just looking at A versus time, the steps almost seem to have uh, y, or excuse me, A values that are almost exponentially larger going from left to right. And we'll see that in a second when we take a look at the graph from a different perspective of what's going on. So uh, how we could summarize this, we could say that for each different 
fixed time period, the relationship between future value and present value is linear, and um, the slope represents how many dollars of future value you get for every dollar of present value. So up here, if you invest for 30 years at 5% compounded monthly, uh, an investment of $100 will yield you $446.77, which is the same as saying that'll be $4.47 for every 100 that you invest. And that should be the same because this is a linear relationship with a y-intercept of zero. If I take this divided by the number of dollars I invested, which would be 4.46, and 4.467 all the way across since uh, this is a linear function. And each of these start at the... Um, at the uh, at the origin, since investing zero dollars will result in you getting a future value of zero dollars. Okay, well I could look at this from another perspective as well. What if I change the reduction function and I look at the reduction function of instead of holding t constant, I hold p constant. All right, so that means that now if I if I were to uh, r build this function right here, this would be a of 100, 0 0.05, 12, and t. And of course, that's going to reduce to 100 times uh, 1 plus 0 0.05 divided by 12 to the 12t power. And maybe you see this already, but this now is an exponential function because the, the, the variation is occurring in the exponent, and it tells us basically how many times we multiply by the, uh, by the base factor. So we multiply 12t times. And as a result, what we should see from another dimension is going to be, well, guess what? The exponential relationship we saw here between a and t, assuming we hold p constant, is the same thing we should see in the other regards as well. So let me just um, make a new data table here. And actually, I'll do it down here so that I can now put uh, p and t. So I'll put t along the rows. Since we're going to be fixing um, p, at let's say 100, and I'll look at it for different time periods. Maybe I'll just go in five year increments up all the way up to, I'll just take this plus five, and take this maybe up to time 30, and look at uh, the future value. So now I'm gonna relabel these. I'll call this row, this is gonna be my, my t, my time. I'll ha get, have to give it a different name because I've already named another row time, and I'll just name this column p for the present value and now I can just do uh, p times 1 plus 0 0.05 divided by 12 raised to the 12 times uh, t power alright good it's referencing all the values I want and copying that on down we see that as time increases of course your future value increases as well now, we shouldn't be surprised that really this row for p equals 100 is the same as this column for p equals 100. Well, almost, except we're not showing the zero time up here, but we are down here. So it's really this column right here is pretty much this row right here. So we're just looking at it from the different perspective. In other words, I'm not interested in a versus p holding time constant. I'm interested in a versus t holding p constant. And now I can do the same thing. I'm going to insert a graph, insert a separate one here. And let's see. So we want to do a 3D graph. So we'll do that once again. Come over here, select my data, add my entries. My series name is P equals 100. And my values are going to be those. But of course, uh, I don't want 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 along those labels. So I'm going to come over here and edit the horizontal axis and tell it to grab the uh, x values from right there. So now I have the exponential relationship I thought I would have. So now I, I need to kind of label this again. This is a versus t 12% or sorry 5% compounded monthly. And I'm going to label my axes again so I know what I'm looking at. This is the future value. This is the time and this is the principal value that I initially invest. And so you can see that as time increases, we get an exponential relationship, which guess what? If I do the 3D rotation of this, then you're gonna notice that looking at A versus T holding P fixed, 
I get an exponential relationship, just like I do here. So it's a matter of ro rotating one graph to basically see what we're seeing in the other graph. And again, I could do this for another set of values. Let me do this in a $100 increments up to 100 or 500, excuse me. So if I add 100 to that, I am going to get 200, and I'll go all the way up to maybe 500 and copy this row down so I can see those different variations. So hopefully by now we're getting kind of comfortable with uh, seeing this from different perspectives and maybe just generating the 3D graph at once. So there it is. And guess what? If I rotate this guy, if I do the 3D rotation of him and I look at it from the side, what you're going to notice is that, and this might be a little bit hard to see, but the relationship here is actually linear. The distance between this point, this point, and this point, this point, and this point is constant which is the graph that I'm seeing over here. Assuming t is 30, then this green line corresponds to basically, imagine a point created by each of these lines here, uh, these noodles or whatever you want to call them, and you connect them this way, the relationship will be linear. Okay, well this will become a lot more apparent whenever we actually turn this into a surface. So I'm going to change my chart type, and I'm going to change it into a 3D surface by coming over here and selecting surface and now you can see the again the contours you know this is a very low contour region as you get all the way up to this dark blue that's a uh, very high altitude if you will and as I begin to rotate this thing you can now see in a little bit more detail the exponential relationship going this way and looking at that from different it's almost like a sheet of paper as if you took the tip of one or one of those corners and lifted it up a little bit higher than the other corners you get this uh, three-dimensional surface so very cool stuff that we can do with it. The last thing that, uh, oh, and so now, now we would say, if we wanted to summarize what's going on here, we could say that uh, if you were to hold time constant, I'm um, sorry, if you were to hold, go back to my original uh, graph, if I were to hold the how much I invested constant and I looked at the relationship between my future value and how much time has passed, the relationship is such that the future value grows exponentially over time. And that's something, probably the, the, thing, the thing that we're most f familiar with with the compound interest function. Compound interest is exponential because it's interest on top of whatever your current balance is. It's a percentage change of your current balance. Okay, and so um, now we could also look at this one other way. And that other way is going to be to, uh, oh, we already did that, is to actually looking at, uh, thinking about holding a value of the input fixed really as a cross-section of the graph. So we can do this in GeoGebra, and it's a little bit tricky in GeoGebra. You have to be careful uh, because GeoGebra uh, doesn't allow you to actually do a lot of 3D scaling. But if I go over to View, and I change my three, uh, to a 3D graphics view, uh, so I'm actually going to um, minimize this a little bit. And so in this 3D graphics view, I want to have that selected. I'm going to type in the function f of x, y, and what I'm going to do here is if I'm going to let x be my present value and do the 1 times 1 plus 0 0.05 divided by 12 to the 12 parentheses times y power where y is actually the amount of time. So f of x, y is the future value, x is the present value, y is the amount of time that's passed. Now I click enter and you can probably see that something that looks somewhat similar to what we had graphed earlier. So I'm going to do uh, select move graphics view so I can really just look at the region of the graph that I'm interested in. Um, over here there are negative x, negative values, positive values going this way. And so I just want to focus in on just that positive first quadrant. And so you can see that uh, I guess we could try to figure out which axis is which. In other words, is this the, is looking at it this way, is the red axis the time or present value? Well, this is your balance, and your balance is small because we're looking at really small values of the other variable. And the other perspective is to look at it, well, one perspective is that way, and the other perspective is kind of, uh, well, it's the same thing. It's going to be really hard to see which axis is which, but you can almost see that the relationship here is fairly linear. This looks like a nice straight line here. And so now the question is, what does it mean to actually talk about uh, those individual like lines that we saw? Well, let me, let me hold my time fixed. Now, we said that we're going to let time be represented by y. Okay, so 
y is the time in this equation up here. And I'm going to set my t fixed time to, let's say, y equals 2 years. And I press Enter. And what you see here as a result is this green sheet of paper, or what we call a plane, is actually slicing through the graph of future value versus, in this case, uh, this is the uh, present value, different values of the present value, and so the green axis is actually time. And what we get is we get this cross section. Imagine if you were to chop an apple straight down the middle, the resulting shape that you would get, and if you kind of look at this, you can see that line, uh, which is the intersection between the red surface and the green plane, representing the, the, the amount of time. And what I can also do is I can come over to my 2D view, and I can actually plot the resulting function that I would get um, by means of saying, okay, I really want to plot f of x. Let me do this. Let me put in a, 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 a scroll bar or a, a slider, and I'm going to call this. Uh, I'm going to call this time. And what I will come over here and do is now plot the function f of x comma time. What that's going to do is it's going to create the line corresponding to what it, to a fixed time period that I have here. And I'm also going to change this to be time so I can control that. Whoops. That's not exactly what I wanted. Okay. So now now what I can do is I can actually uh, control the, the fixed value of time. So I'm doing a reduction function here. And you can notice what's going on uh, with respect to uh, this new function g of x that's been created, which in the exponent has the current value of time that's on my slider. So as you, you notice as I'm moving that slider, we're fixing the value of time. And at the same uh, moment, we're seeing that the green plane is moving and it's creating a cross section or intersecting that red surface in different points. And then what we're graphing over here is the resulting line that's formed by that cross section. So the only thing that's changing to each of those lines that's being formed by the, the, the fixing of time is the slope of that line, which if we go back to our Excel spreadsheet, that's exactly the difference that we had back here. So if I uh, undo our change, then each of these lines is really just an individual cross section of what we have here, and the line is being graphed over on this side. Now I could do the exact same thing here. I could say, uh, well, let me, instead of controlling the y value or the time value, let me control the corresponding present value. And then we're going to let time be the variable. I'm going to click Apply. I need to do a couple of things here. OK, so now I've got a graph. And now you notice that the, that the plane that intersects the red surface is actually uh, perpendicular to the plane that we had originally, which was going basically from left to right along uh, the, the way we see the graph right now. So now the plane is going the opposite direction. And I notice that if I turn the graph to now be looking at the blue axis, which is my future value, and the green axis, which is time, the resulting cross section forms this, uh, this exponential function here, which shouldn't be of too much surprise to us. But if I start to look at the corresponding just plot the what I'm seeing here as the cross section in the 3D view, what I'm actually seeing is exactly a nice, beautiful exponential function. And if I change, this is not actually time anymore. This is now the present value. If I adjust the present value, the more I invest, the steeper or the, the more quickly that exponential function will grow. Um, again, taking percentage of larger numbers produces a larger number. And so um, I'm really just controlling the, the, the steepness, if you will, or the quickness with which that exponential function rises amount-wise. So these are just different ways to think about multivariable functions. And um, some, some these ways of thinking are really important because uh, thinking about a three-dimensional surface in and of itself is really complicated. So be thinking about these components of holding one thing constant and allowing another thing to vary.